of commitment. The commitment is made at our first burial. You see, hearers of the word retain life in death. At their first burial, they, they put a, 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 a seat saver in eternity. They retain life. And doers of the word receive life in death. That's at your second burial. Whenever you go under, you really get the life. And so between the times that we retain life and we receive life, we have to live life. We have to have actions, not words. And so this morning, I want to look at two different people. I want to look at a person who lived the life, and then I want to look at a person who is living the life. We'll look at their words, and we'll look at the actions. And so the person that we're going to look at first, the person who lived the life, was Peter. And so we'll look at his words first. Let's set up the scenario. Read with me verses 27 through 28. You will all fall away, Jesus told them. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And so Jesus is claiming that his disciples are going to fall away. And not a, not a literal loss of salvation falling away, just, just a simple, you know, I'm just not going to associate with you, Jesus. I, he's saying you're going to disassociate with me. You're going to feel ashamed of me. This takes place between the time of the Last Supper and then going to the garden. It takes place a few hours before Jesus is actually betrayed by Judas. And so Jesus says this for one very specific reason. He says the shepherd is going to be struck. And not too long ago, Jesus actually claimed to be the shepherd. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And we've discussed before that Jesus is crucifixion. It was a fulfillment of prophecy made hundreds of years before, fulfilled in the minute details. Now understand that it was God's will to crucify Jesus. Here he quotes from Zechariah 13, 7 about striking the sheep, and the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. And so God wanted to crush Jesus. Understand that. Read with me Isaiah 53 says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will set his offspring, see his offspring, and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So what Isaiah is talking about hundreds of years before it happened is that, number one, God is going to kill Jesus. It is his desire to crush him, to make him a, a guilt offering, a sin offering, to become our atonement, our propitiation for sins. But Isaiah also talks about his resurrection, prolonging of his days, and prospering. And so this is what Jesus was talking about in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. He didn't just give his Son just so that the world could know God, but he gave his Son so that the world could see God. And the only way that was possible is if Jesus died. And so... As brutal as what it sounds, God gave his son to be killed for your sake. And Jesus is telling them, hey guys, whenever I die, you're going to act like you don't know me. You're going to run away, you're going to hide, you're going to be afraid. And even more than that, he's saying, this very night, whenever I get arrested, you're going to act like you don't know me. You're going to act like a teenager with their parents, whenever they're around their friends, you know, whatever. Been there, done that. There was a time in my life when my parents were dumb, and I was ashamed of them. And praise God, that's not the case anymore. But Jesus is telling them, you guys are going to, you guys are going to run away from me. Now, Mark doesn't, uh, he doesn't retain that idea, not, not in the in idea, in the King James Version, as I know some of you are King James people, and that's good. Uh, 
in, in the King James and other versions, it actually has it talked about how this very night you will betray me. Now, the NIV doesn't have that. I don't know if it's because of, of uh, new discoveries of manuscripts that they translated from, but we do know that Jesus is talking about that very night. Matthew <laughs> records him saying, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. Now, Peter, Peter can't believe it. He, he, he just he, he can't stand it. And Peter, in normal Peter fashion, whenever he has something on his mind, he says it. And so let's look at what Peter said in the next few verses. Peter declared, Even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you, and all the others said the same. Now, this is off to the side. I just told you how the NIV doesn't say yes tonight, and here uh, the, the newest version of the NIV does say that. My apologies. It's in 1984 version. So anyway, Peter expresses himself here with his words and with his actions. He says, uh, in two different ways, he says, I'm not going to deny you. He says, even if all fall away, Jesus, I'm going to stay right here. He says, even if I have to die, Jesus, I'm never, ever going to disown you. You know what this sounds like? This sounds like whenever children are trying to show how serious they are. Now, I'm telling the truth, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a thousand needles in my eye. <laughs> serious? You want a thousand needles stuck in your eye? I used to say that, and never once, not once, did I literally mean that I wanted, that I wanted to die, or that I wanted needles stuck in my eye. I don't know what I was thinking, just what I said, be serious. But that's not what Peter's doing here. Peter's serious. He says, Jesus, I'm going to die for you if I have to. And that's, that's exactly what we see with Peter expressing himself, not only here with his words, but also with his actions. You see, whenever push comes to shove, Peter's ready to put his money where his mouth is. Whenever Judas came out with the soldiers and the religious leaders, Peter was, was ready to go. Uh, 14, verse 47, says that the men seized Jesus and arrested him. One of them was standing near, drew his sword, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. John tells us this, this swordsman is Peter. So here, Peter is uh, not only telling Jesus, but he's showing us. Jesus, look, hey, this is my attitude. Hey, if you guys want him, cool. You gotta go through me. I'm gonna take a couple of you out. I'm sure I will die, but first off, I'm showing Jesus how serious I am. And that was Peter's attitude in the garden. But then Jesus tells Peter it's not necessary. He says, listen, Peter, I've got, I've got a legions of angels at my hands that if I want a snap of a finger, they would come down here and rescue me. I don't need your sword. He who lives by the sword, Peter, will die by the sword. And so with that, Peter, along with all of the disciples, including a young man who, as a result of being grabbed, he ran away naked, they all, they all left him. And I, some of you may be thinking, well, there's, I don't remember any streakers in the Bible. We'll talk about it in a couple of weeks. But uh, Peter leaves. The disciples, the sheep, are scattered. Now, even though everybody left, I'm going to say focused on Peter. Because Peter was specific in saying, I will not believe you. And Jesus was specific in saying, Peter, <coughs> before the rooster crows, you're going to disown me. And so, Let's look at what Peter does once he's away from Jesus in verses 66 through 72. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came up. 
When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene, Jesus, she said. But he denied her. I don't know, or I don't understand what you're talking about, he said. And he went out into the entry room. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, This fellow, this fellow is one of them. <coughs> again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and he wept. So whenever Peter was right there next to Jesus, he was firmly in the state of mind that he was never going to deny Jesus. He adamantly swore to Jesus, I will never disown you. But yet we see the further from Jesus Peter got, the easier it was for him to deny him. You see, Peter was ashamed of Jesus because he was worried about his own life. And, and this is a very interesting spot here that Peter is in. These aren't guards. These aren't religious leaders who are going to kick him out of the synagogue. These are girls.
See, Paul tells us what baptism is about. He writes about it in Romans chapter 6. He says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. And so in baptism, you united yourself with the death and the resurrection of Jesus. This is how we can understand the, the, the act and, and the word better, because there's no other act of baptism that completely unites us into his death. You know, think about whatever the funerals you've been to, as they think about your funeral, but you probably won't be there. You'd be there. You'd better be there at your funeral. <laughs> Ground. They don't just put a little bit of dirt on it. They put it completely under the earth, six feet under. And so, in baptism, we go completely under. We unite ourselves with Jesus' death. At that point, we're saying, I want to die. I want to die in order to live. And then we live. We are raised up with Jesus' <coughs> resurrection. We retain life at that point. See, whenever you were baptized, you were made a new creation. The old person was crucified with Christ, and the new person was raised. The old had gone, as Paul says, and the new has come. Something that has never been before. I mean, and at that point, you were excited. I mean, you were jumping, life, life, eternal life. Oh, what a glorious day, the sun, the sun, it's shining so much brighter. Do you hear the birds? Oh, it's so great. And then the songs that you sang, they were real, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You were a soldier marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. You were on fire. And though none go with you, still you were prepared to follow Jesus. You were excited. You came up out of the water, sort of like dumb.
And the young man was complaining about church and, oh, why do I have to go to church? I've got the Bible. Why can't I just read the Bible? Why can't that be good? The old man didn't say anything. He just grabbed a stick and poked it in the fire and flung out a, a hot coal. Didn't say anything, just watched it. And as they sat there, that single coal grew darker and darker and colder and colder. And so finally the old man bent down, he picked it up, and he set it back into the fire. He said, that's why the church is in the world. See, there was a reason that the early church and the early Christians met together often. In fact, the book of Acts says every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. Every day. And in addition to that, they were meeting on the Lord's Day on Sunday to remember Jesus' death through communion. There was a reason that the author of Hebrews urged his audience. He wrote, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You see, Christians were meeting together often to encourage one another, to strengthen one another, to build each other up. Because things were tough back then. I mean, you think it's hard to live in Indiana or even in the United States. Things were hard back then. And so Christians got together. They said, hold on, brother. Hold on, sister. This suffering is just going to go on for a little bit longer. Jesus is going to come back. We're going to be with him. And all of this is going to be forgotten. Just so hold on. And so whenever you neglect church, you run the risk of forgetting your commitment to Christ. And neglecting church usually happens as a result of small compromises. You miss the first Sunday and you feel guilty about it. And, and, but then you, you, you miss the second Sunday and it's really not that big of a deal. It's, it's less guilt. And then the third and the fourth, and it's just like, man, this is easier to do than getting up and going. You see, this leads us to our second reason for forgetting, which is small compromises. My clicker's not working. You know, they say that Rome wasn't built in a day. And so we didn't, oh, that's why it's not clicking. That's okay. Uh, so Rome wasn't built in a day, and so whatever you are, you, you are who you are right now, it didn't occur by little changes, good or bad. Now, I'm not saying that missing church is a sin. But I am saying it's an unwise compromise. And it can lead to making more unwise choices, which could lead to sin. See, small compromises lead to big changes over time. Heard of a story, I don't know if it's true or not, but for pretend, let's pretend it's true. There was a church uh, that hired a new minister, and he wanted a piano on the other side of the Oh, they're on the uh, on the other side of the pulpit, other side of the stage. And so he asked the folks, he said, hey, can we move the piano? I said, oh, no, no, you can't move it. It's always been there. If the piano wasn't there, a uh, little old church lady playing the piano, she wouldn't know what to do. It's okay, fine. But every week, he would move the piano over just one inch. You know what? Nobody noticed. And after several months, the piano was on the other side of the stage. Johnny Cash sang a song about building a car one piece at a time. You can look at certain denominational churches across America and see these small compromises leading to <coughs> big changes. You know, not too long ago, uh, just to say yesterday, the question was, should women be allowed in the pulpit? Today, the question is, should homosexuals be allowed in the pulpit? Tomorrow, who knows? Maybe the question will be, do we even need a pulpit? Do we even need church? Small compromises in your faith lead to big sin. Tooth decay is a process, and so spiritual decay is a process. The final thing that can cause you to forget about your commitment to baptism is unrepentant sin. Unrepentant sin. Over time, unrepentant sin will begin to accumulate like plaque on your teeth. 
It will cause you to see God as distant, and it will lead you to believe that you can't get close to Him, that you can't be with Him. And eventually, it will cause you to forget about your commitment to Christ, your desire to die. And not only this, but continual <coughs> sin can cause you to forfeit your salvation. The author of Hebrews writes, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. You look at Judas and you look at Peter. They both sinned against Jesus. Peter repented and lived a life for Jesus, whereas Judas died in his sin. He got what he deserved. He took his own life. And so the question for you this morning is, are you in a similar position as Peter or Judas? Are you denying Jesus? Are you denying the commitment that you once made to Christ maybe many, many years ago, but since You've just kind of wandered away because sometimes the further away we get from the waters of baptism, the easier it is to deny Christ, just like it was for Peter. The further away he got from Jesus, the easier it was for him to forget what he had said. This can happen from neglecting church or by making small compromises in your faith or in your life which lead to unrepentant sin. It can even happen from not exercising your own choice in the matter, and thus never really finding the light. You see, hearers of the word retain life and death, but doers of the word receive life and death. And so, since you retain life, have you been living a life in order to receive it one day? Or, have you just been living life for yourself? So perhaps you've heard the word all of your life, but you've never submitted to it. You've done what it said, you've never done what it said, and thus you haven't been a doer of the word. If that's the case, I invite you to come forward this morning to unite with Jesus in his death, burial, and with his resurrection, to live a new life, committing yourself to him. If, on the other hand, you, you recognize that you've been living in such a way that you have forgotten that you're committed to Christ. One, one time you did say, yes, I want to be a Christian. But since then, you've kind of uh, wondered away. I invite you, if that's, if that's in your case this morning, to come forward for a little Prayer or even recommitment. So if you would, let's stand and sing the song of invitation, because he lives.